Uh, it's a knowledge knowledge. Okay, we are live now. Okay. Hello, good afternoon. We are back with another session on the knowledge sharing series promoted by health travelers worldwide. The objective of the knowledge sharing series is to bring credible medical information to the public at large through enriching conversations with renowned experts from across the world. I am Dr. Gayatri Gadyok, your host and moderator today. A little bit about myself. I did my MBBS from Christian Medical College, Ljubljana, and my MD from Olana Azad Medical College, New Delhi. I worked in histopathology and hematology for more than 30 years and then switched to hospital administration and management as part of the founding team and medical director for Fortis La Farm Delhi, the first comprehensive facility for women's healthcare in the country. I then joined WHO. Sorry about that. I then joined WHO, where my focus was on public health, program development, and quality assurance in the Asia Pacific region. A few years ago, as a WHO consultant, I joined hands with the Ministry of Health in Kerala to its to establish systems for quality blood transfusion services. In addition to healthcare, I'm also the chairperson of a nonprofit NGO called Rohini Gadiok Foundation that works in the field of education, providing for underprivileged children. Given my work and areas of interest, I'm particularly pleased to be collaborating with health travelers worldwide and healthcare professionals to discuss relevant issues that we are faced with at this time. Health Travelers Worldwide is an NABH accredited health advisory firm that helps critically ill patients seeking quality healthcare services. It works independently to provide prospective patients with personalized advice and support through its dedicated medical advisors. Over the years, it has built the highest level of trust and confidence amongst more than 7,000 patients, besides working with some of the top insurance companies ministries of health and international NGOs. I have the pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Gurdeep Singh Sethi, medical oncologist and hematologist with more than 30 years of experience in cancer management, immuno-oncology, precision medicine, pain management, and palliative care. Understanding the need for a comprehensive cancer care in India, Dr. Sethi moved back after spending 26 years in the US, where he is triple board certified in medical oncology, hematology, and internal medicine. He currently practices in Gurgaon, and his areas of expertise include hematology, molecular and targeted therapy, hormone therapy, immunotherapy, genetic counseling and testing, palliative care, and cancer screening. Today, we will be discussing reimagining cancer care during current times. The problems faced by cancer patients, including how to address their fears and anxiety, children coping with cancer, the challenges related to delays in treatment, screening, and restoring patient confidence. We will also discuss the dynamics of newer treatments evolving in cancer care. Please ask any questions you may have on the subject and share them with us in the comment section. We will try and take as many as possible. Dr. Sethi, welcome to the show. Can you please share with us your take on today's topic, reimagining cancer care during current times? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Gayatri, for the kind introduction. I hope you can hear me. Can hear you, yes. Yeah. Thank you for the kind introduction. And uh, thank you, uh, health travelers worldwide for uh, bringing me in this discussion and talk. Uh, today's topic is about cancer and cancer care in this COVID environment. It is a trying time for all of us. And uh, as we all know that the situation for cancer management, cancer care has changed because of the introduction of coronavirus into our lives and into our system. As we all are aware that COVID-19 is an illness caused by a novel corona coronavirus, uh, which was first identified in Wuhan in China in December 2019. 
this virus can spread from person to person through small droplets, okay, from the nose or mouth that are produced when a person sneezes, coughs, or speaks. Any other person can catch this by breathing in these droplets or by touching surfaces that have been contaminated. This situation is now pandemic. Every, every continent in this globe is now involved. So if you bring on the slideshow, please, Shivani. Shivani, can you hear me? So we have a couple of slides that Dr. Sethi would uh, discuss. And uh, after that, we will have a general discussion. Right. So let's go to the next one. And the next. So in this uh, <coughs> graph released by, the, released by the WHO, you can see that every continent is now involved. It's a true pandemic. In India today, we have 300,000 300, plus cases with 150,000 recovered patients and over 8,900 patients dead from the disease today. Next. <laughs> Corona uh, and cancer patients. Like any other infectious diseases, people with compromised immune systems or major medical problems, including patients with active cancer and cancer survivors are at an increased risk for hospitalization and possible death. A meta-analysis in the JCO oncology found that 2.1% of patients diagnosed with COVID-19 have had or have cancer. As per Lancet Oncology, out of 15,900 patients, 18 patients had a history of cancer. Technically, the authors conclude that the patients with cancer have a higher risk for COVID-19 and a poor prognosis because of their immunized, uh, because of their immunocompromised state. So why do cancer patients stand at a higher risk for COVID-19? This is because most of the cancer patients that we find today, they are of an older age. Next slide, please. Uh, they are of an older age. They are 50, 60 and above. They have more comorbidities. They have diabetes, they have high blood pressure, they have <laughs> suppressed immune systems. They are also more in contact with the healthcare systems by recurrent visits to doctors and hospitals for other diseases. And the immunity is already low because of cancer or due to cancer treatment. And these patients have a poorer performance status. That means they are spending more than 50% of the time in the chair or in the bed. So their immune system is slow. <clears throat> this, this leads to higher risk of COVID cancer involvement. COVID-19 involvement, sorry. Next. <laughs> cancer patients show, <clears throat> we see that there's an uh, overexpressed immunosuppressive cytokines in these patients. There's a suppressed induction of pro-inflammatory danger signals, and there's impaired dendritic cell maturation. All these lead to immunosuppressive leukocyte population and therefore decreased immune system. Data also shows that people who have had chronic tobacco use have an increased expression of ACE2, which is the binding receptor for severe respiratory syndrome, corona 2 virus. And this explains an elevated susceptibility to COVID-19 in smokers. Next. So, so uh, I'm going to interrupt here, Dr. Sethi. Sure. So for the, for the lay person, what you're saying is they have a low immune system. And because of comorbidities, like, say, if they've been smokers and they have a compromised lung function, they are more susceptible Correct. to the infection. Okay. Correct. Yes. Their, their immune system is sharp. And uh, smoking improves the 
attachment of the vir viruses to the ACE2 uh, receptors more ag aggressively. Okay. That is correct. Uh, so if you look at cancer treatment during this pandemic, where do we go? How do we prioritize, prior, prioritize the healthcare for cancer patients during this time? Now, if you look at patients with low volume disease or slow growing disease or very early disease, the priority for getting treatment right away is low. So people with says bone meds or low grade prostate cancer, they're on surveillance studies mostly or people on active surveillance they can wait, they don't have to visit the healthcare right away. All right, <clears throat> the disease is not going anywhere very fast. People with imminent risks of early mortality, acute leukemias, aggressive lymphomas, germ cell tumors, you know, people who require immediate intervention for uh, cord compression due to tumor, life-threatening diseases, those ones have higher priority to get treatment during the pandemic. So the whole system has changed. In the past, everybody came, they got taken care of, they were seen and, and you know, taken to proper evaluation, treatment, stepwise. With COVID being around, it has changed how we approach things. The so people acute, with- the aggressive, Sorry, sorry to interrupt again, but so what you're saying is that those who are more stable and there's no emergency, they don't necessarily have to rush to the hospitals and start their treatment. That is correct. People okay. with stable disease, low-grade disease can wait. They don't have to okay. rush. The system is already overburdened by this uh, COVID infection. The healthcare resources are already being diverted to one disease. It's a pandemic. It's life-threatening. Uh, many people are, are already, the, the system is already overburdened by the right. disease. So we right. have to make sure that patients that come in are not infected by the disease. And uh, they require the treatment. So that's why the priority changes. Some have lower priority, some have higher priority. That's what we're looking at. Okay. Next. Again, uh, another slide from, uh, and this is from uh, Annals of Oncology. Uh, this is decision regarding immediate cancer treatment during COVID-19 crisis. So people who are of lower risk, we can wait for at least three months. It's in the chart. So Anybody want to review this later, they can look at this uh, YouTube or Facebook slides. And the people with higher risk, which they're the ones who we cannot delay. They are ideal that we have to get into treatment right away. So this chart explains everything so pretty clearly out there. Next. Uh, if you look at guidelines that are coming in for oncologists and for healthcare workers, these are recommendations by the European Society of Medical Oncology. Oncologists remain ready to adjust their routines. A lot of routines everywhere by all doctors have been shuffled and readjusted. Telemedicine is the way to go. Patients who are stable, given a call, a video conference, a Zoom call, get their consultation, move ahead. In the US and, and, and the Western countries, insurances are playing, paying the same whether you visit the doctor or you get a teleconference done. Healthcare has not been disrupted that way. This reduces clinic visits and exposure. There's a switching to subcutaneous and oral therapies where possible, cutting down IV time so that patient has minimal exposure. And there's also advice on supporting patients on infection control. So this is strongly recommended by our ESMO and ASCO societies. If you look at the NHS in England, individual patients' decisions have to be made by multidisciplinary teams. Everything is on teleconference, and it's only by guidance of established priority groups for surgery and cancer treatments are being given. Right. 
So these are very practical things that uh, um, our audience should know about, you know, because teleconsultation is now become quite the norm in India too. And um, they are able to present their clinical symptoms and their test reports and uh, consult with their doctors virtually. Correct. And this is picking up more as people are coming, becoming more aware of it. I'm seeing a lot more consults online. Right. Uh, a lot of my patients are from Punjab. They can travel, so they just call in. And they're still getting the management and they're getting the treatment locally. And it has helped out a lot. This would be the right. way of the future too, because COVID is not going away fast. It's here. So we just have to learn how to change things around to get the best right. treatment. Next. Now, these are, as we all know, these are standard protection routines against COVID-19. Uh, this is being promoted by every institute, every center that we go to. Uh, technically, build your immunity, wash your hands, stay at home, have your vitamins, eat healthy, wear a face mask when you go out, avoid crowds, exercise regularly. You know, keep your mind busy. These are standard things that happen. And this is the same for our cancer patients. It's no different. All right. Right. These messages have been, you know, uh, are in uh, the media. People are talking about it. People are, are aware about it. So the message that we have to send to our audience today is that even for cancer patients, these same messages apply. You know, whether it's wearing a mask, whether it's washing hands frequently or social distancing, keeping your immunity up. Yeah. True, very true. And, and very standard. Uh, most of the recommendations are standard, even for cancer patients. Nothing changes. Next. So uh, talking about the impact on oncology by COVID-19. We see delay in treatment of active cases. This is happening across the board. Uh, people are scared to go to the hospital because of COVID-19. People are scared to go to crowded places. People are scared to go for their scans, for their uh, assessment, for everything. Uh, they're not getting labs done. It is affecting the whole system. There's an interruption in all the clinical trials and research. Lots of money has been put in. Uh, funding has been done, research has all been halted. The screening and testing has been delayed tremendously. And the health staff, even from oncology services, have been directed towards coronavirus activities. Giving an example, in the UK, as for NHS, there's an average of 30,000 patients being diagnosed with cancer every month. In the month of April, there were only 5,000 patients died. So 25,000 is still missing. They're there, but they're not coming forward. In the US, it's 5,000 cases per day we are diagnosing in the past. We're not seeing those numbers now. So what is this going to result in? Yeah. So by 2025, we're going to look back and see all these patients who have bloomed into stage four, late stage, tremendous tumor burden, increased morbidity. I'm going to say, what else could we have done? So I encourage people to continue to try to get their regular treatment on time and, and get to their doctors, even if it's by teleconference, to be proactive in still taking care of themselves. All right. There's, you're going to see a lot more stage four diseases, progressive cancer. There'll be an increase of burden on the healthcare, and there'll be a collapse of the basic screening facilities. So, no, so highly recommend that you continue to uh, be proactive in your follow-ups and treatments. At this time, everybody's coming up with a novel, uncomplicated uncompl studies, tests to see what we can do to detect cancer and things that we can do from home. One such test that's been developed in Germany and is now being used in Europe is also being brought to India. It's a test called Phantom Detect. It should be introduced soon to our country too. Next. So, <clears throat> care of cancer patients affected by COVID-19. Home quarantine services, all right. As per guidelines of the government of India, 
most of the asymptomatic COVID patients are now being best managed at home, quarantined for 14 days. Many tertiary care institutes and healthcare organizations have started providing home quarantine services for affected patients. We at Millennium Cancer Center are providing the same package for cancer patients and for, for, for corona, corona patients. And these include video consultation by doctors, nurse visits, vital signs, vital signs monitoring, wellness checkup, sanitization kits, dietary counseling. This is standard and it applies to cancer patients and applies to everybody. Next. Yeah, this, this is a good initiative and it's quite reassuring, um, you know, for people who, who feel that they can avail of healthcare from a distance and yet be connected to their physicians. That is important. Uh, that's what I'm trying to say is that patients have to be connected. Doctors yeah. can't chase patients at home because if they don't know what's happening. It's the doctors, the patients have to be connected to their doctors and that's very important. And fact. So next is uh, health. Next slide, please. Uh, sorry. Next slide is uh, about uh, healthy eating no, think, and immune supplement. I think, yeah. Uh, uh, can we go, go back, back go to back the back. previous slide? I think we missed a slide here. Can we go back to the right. previous slide, please? Yeah. 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 So healthy eating and immune supplementation. Everyday foods to improve your immune system. That's what we need to work on. Technically, healthy foods, citrus foods, cit citrus fruits, vegetables, ginger, garlic, berries, the whole list of things you see on WhatsApp University every day. But definitely cancer patients being higher risk categories should consume the above healthy food. And also vitamin C, multivitamins, zinc, and vitamin D. These boost your immune system. We have to keep the immune system active to fight cancer and fight COVID. This is important message I want to get. Next slide, yeah. General public health recommendations issued by the US Center uh, for Disease Control and Prevention. It's standard everywhere. It's the same thing we talked about earlier. Social distancing, frequent and proper washing of, of hands, avoiding large crowds, keeping surfaces clean and disinfected, avoid touching your face if not necessary, and wearing a mask in public. Message is the same, universal, everywhere, cancer patients or not. This is important. Next. Something that people should be aware of. If a person has tested positive for COVID, a cancer patient before coming back to start treatment, they will be retested. So treatment should not be resumed until the symptoms of COVID-19 have resolved. And there's some certainty that the virus is no longer present. All right. And you have to have a negative COVID test. This, however, in certain circumstances, circumstances can circumstances can be avoided if they have a rapidly progressing acute leukemic or you know, life-threatening uh, disease. Next, stress and anxiety in cancer survivors during COVID-19. We're all homebound. We're all in isolation, you know, lockdown mode. So there are a few ways to keep your stress down. Develop a routine. I know you're not going to work, you're not going to get up at 10 o'clock next day, 12 o'clock. No, make a routine. Make a routine for your time. When you wake up, exercise regular, check with your friends, be in contact with your family, uh, talk to your doctor if you have to, you know, go for yoga, deep breathing exercises, you know, take a walk. If you are able to in an open environment where there's no crowd, if you are able to, all right. And then, Meditation, uh, you know, alone with alone, tremendous, tremendous help. Okay, and stay in touch with the people you love. Virtual communication and telephone calls. Keep yourself busy. All right, pick up a new habit. All right, learn to play music, learn to sing, learn to cook. All right, and again, start a new hobby. 
do anything to stimulate your mind. Play Sudoku, all right? Uh, but amongst all this time, make sure you're always in touch with your oncologist. This is very important. Next. For all people coming in to our clinic, we have a COVID assessment screen, screening program. And there's a questionnaire that we have regarding the coronavirus infection. And we give a score. So if you have less than three, you have very low risk or no risk. Your routine temperature checking, checking oxygen, checking everything, then you come in. Age criteria, comorbidities, those all add up in the score. So people with low risk, fine, they can come in. People with higher risk, we do a rapid COVID screening test before they come in and get treatment. So this is this can be applicable to all uh, medical services everywhere across the country. Next. Talk about children. I'm not a pediatric oncologist, uh, but I've talked to my colleagues. We're seeing that their care has not been changed or disturbed in any way due to the COVID situation. All right. Most of the childhood diseases, cancer diseases, are aggressive. There are either leukemias, lymphomas, brain and spinal cord tumors, sarcomas, and uh, neuroblastomas. These are all aggressive diseases, and they need to be prioritized and given action right away. These children cannot wait, so they have to be taken care of immediately. <laughs> so, any if you if you need more uh, on this, take uh, seek opinion from your pediatric oncologist immediately, because these cancers are aggressive and need treatment right away. Next. There's certain genetic factors that are involved or have higher association, association with COVID-19. So there are two hypotheses which indicate towards the genetic predispos predisposition in COVID-19. Men are more susceptible of getting infection. More than 65% cases, 65 cases are male and 45% cases, 35% are female. Women have a better immune system. They are more resilient, they are more they're stronger, no matter what or anybody else says. Okay. And a very interesting finding that came out with the 23andMe study group. They found that pe people with blood group O uh, have a better protection and 10 to 15% less likely to get infected as opposed to people with blood group A. Blood group A is linked with a more aggressive COVID infection and is seen in more than 50% of patients. Interesting finding out there. Very interesting, yeah. Yes. Next, <laughs> I'd like to go through a few uh, fact questions that we've been, have been brought up in uh, American Cancer Society uh, and uh, Cancer.net questionnaires. Simple ones, but I'll go through it rapidly. So many people ask, uh, can you briefly describe what it means to be immune compromised? Well, the term immune compromised refers to individuals whose immune system is weaker, impaired, less robust uh, than an average healthy person. And uh, many reasons cause this, as including the uh, cancer itself, uh, patients with diabetes, older patients, patients with heart disease, and uh, lifestyle choices such as smoking, sedentary life, this all com uh, compromises your immune system, makes you more prone to COVID-19. Does a history of cancer raise your risk for health complications from COVID-19? Yes. If you have cancer, you are more prone to catching COVID-19. The risk is as good as having diabetes or hypertension or the comorbid uh, problems, obesity. These are 10 to 15 percent higher than the general population. And but the uh, risk is not then, more than having diabetes, is it? Equal to, equal, equal to, to diabetes. Equal. Yeah, yeah. So, but patients who are looking, who have certain hematological malignancies, they are at a higher risk. Patients with leukemia and lymphoma and myeloma, their immune system is totally shot. Forget the T 
uh, cell system, the B cell, the immunoglobulins, they're all gone. So they're at a 40 to 50% higher risk than the general population. Next question we have is, uh, we're on question number three. Next, please. Yeah. Does having received chemotherapy or radiation therapy in the past raise your risk for getting COVID-19 or having a more serious course of illness? Till date, there's no data suggesting that you have an increased risk if you had chemotherapy in the past more than three months out. After three months of any active treatment, your immune system should be back to normal. But within three months of treatment, yes, your immune system is still weak and you're still more prone. Now, patients with lung cancer who got lung scarring from the cancer or who had radiation to the lung, they're still more prone than the general population, even if they're more than three months out. So, so they have to take more the, care. They have to take, take more, more precautions and take more care. True. And most of these patients have been chronic smokers in the past. They also have COPD and underlying lung disease already. So these are a few things that were important I thought I wanted to share with everybody. Next. All right. Should cancer survivors follow the general public health recommendations? Absolutely, yes. We talked about it in our initial slideshow. Same recommendations by the CDC. Keep social distancing. Frequent and proper hand washing, avoid large crowds, wear a mask, be sensible, be sensible, stay active at home, keep your mental health active. So same, same guidelines, cancer, no cancer. In fact, you should be more uh, vigilant on these things. Next question. I have a central venous catheter port, a port of cast. I've been recommended to get it flushed every four weeks. I don't have active cancer. What do I do? Well, we can wait 12 weeks. It's not a must that I have to get it every four weeks. It's four to six weeks is recommended. But if you're disease free, if you're in remission, you can wait. So this is a very common question that comes up because photocats are put in every patient with cancer in the Western world. Here we're getting more used to it now. Yeah, even here, but this is this is this is uh, reassuring that they, they don't have to rush to get to get their porta cat uh, flushed. That is correct. That is correct. Right. So next question that I have is: It says I'm a cancer survivor who receives regular scans, imaging, follow-ups uh, to detect potential recurrence. Should I get this regularly on the same schedule? As discussed earlier, the surveillance. Tests generally are run every three to six months. If you've been in remission for over a year or two, you can wait, definitely. If you're still three months out, yes, you need to talk to your doctor, get virtual testing uh, and discussions done, and maybe get minimal testing done so that there's minimal exposure to uh, testing outside your environment. If you develop a new symptom that might indicate the cancer recurrence, that's the time you contact your cancer team, and do not wait for your scheduled evaluation. Just go ahead and be proactive and, and get in contact with your doctor earlier. Most of the time you can wait. Next question. All right. Is there anything I can do to improve my general health and my immune system? Yes. Again, standard recommendations from your general uh, health uh, team. Do not smoke, eat a well-balanced diet, exercise regularly, eat enough and get enough sleep and follow the guidelines of social distancing and hand washing. Standard stuff, I mean, whether it's cancer or it's for general public, it doesn't differ. Next question. I'm in the process of diagnosis and staging for cancer. What do I do? Go ahead and get your stuff taken care of. If you are seeing a doctor and your cancer doctor says you're very early stage, low grade, you can wait. If your doctor says this is something that's aggressive, then we have to be right on track to get the test done and the treatment done right away. So, there's a prioritization done depending on the stage 
and the type of disease. So this is a practical question that you have to discuss with your oncologist. They'll be able to guide you more which category you fall in, low uh, risk grade or high risk. So then you have to move accordingly. All right. Next question is, if a cancer patient or cancer survivor feels some early symptoms such as fever or cough, should they contact the medical oncologist or primary care physician? If you are a patient on active cancer treatment and you have these symptoms, call your oncologist right away. If you're a cancer survivor or have had treatment and not on any active cancer treatment, then try to get to your regular GP or your regular doctor first. They would be closer and more available to help you with your current symptoms. Next question. Yeah. If a person is about to start cancer therapy, should they consider postponing treatment due to COVID-19? And what if the patient has been infected with COVID-19? Now, these questions have been answered in our slides earlier too. Yes, again, if you are about to start cancer, and if your cancer is of aggressive type, of a high risk type, go ahead and get started. I know there's a risk of COVID-19, but there's also a high risk of the cancer killing you before, if you don't do anything. So we have to weigh our consequences, see which one is more important. If your cancer is again of a low grade type or can wait, then that's a different issue. And if you've been infected with COVID, you have to wait for the COVID to be cleared up. Unless, as I said, it's a life-threatening cancer that you can't wait. 90%, 95%, you wait for your COVID to clear up before you get started back on treatment. Next question. I have several comorbidities as well as cancer. Am I at a higher risk for COVID-19? Does it matter if those comorbidities are controlled by medication? Well, if you do have hypertension or heart disease or lung or kidney disease or diabetes, you're already at a higher risk for COVID-19. On top of that, if you have cancer too, your immune system is further compromised. You have to take all your medication for your other diseases. There is no question about that. If you have to have chemotherapy, you go ahead about it. Yes, you do have a higher risk, there's no question. But you just have to be aware and adjust things accordingly. Next question. Does smoking or vaping increase the risk of COVID-19? Well, <clears throat> uh, ASCO is not aware of specific data relating to vaping as it's still new. And COVID is also new. But being very clear that smoking increased risk and vaping again is going, taking things into the lung where there's increased risk of aspirating or when inhaling uh, COVID uh, viruses, there is definitely an increased risk and there's going to be more complications from COVID-19. Next. I'm a cancer survivor, and I receive, again receive regular scans. And uh, should I keep getting this test? It's a similar question. We've had it before. Again, it all depends whether uh, you've been a survivor for a long time or you just finished with your treatment. Just finished with your treatment, your surveillance has to be tighter. If you've been disease-free for a long time, you can wait and try not to be exposed to unnecessary risk for COVID. Next question. It has been said that COVID-19 can cause lung scarring. Are other diseases that cause lung scarring, are there other diseases? Yes. And will this increase the chance for developing lung cancer in the future? Well, we do know that certain uh, diseases, TB or uh, psittacosis or lung infection that cause scar can reach, increase the risk of lung cancer. Can COVID itself cause scarring and increased risk for lung cancer? We don't know that yet. COVID is new. But assuming that all other scars have increased risk, we think this could be a contributor too. On the other hand, we know that people who have lung cancer 
and all who've had radiation and damage damage lung, they have an increased risk for COVID-19 infection. It's and, an evolving uh, scenario. It's early days yet. That's absolutely right. The next question is, do most people have long-term effects of COVID-19? It's too soon to say what the long-term of COVID-19 will be. It's just been a few months. However, there's already clear that some patients develop complications in multi, multiple organ systems, including neurological, kidney problems, heart problems, heart failures, blood clots. These serious complications could have long-term consequences, but we still are following up on that. It's too new to define what the long-term complications are going to be. Next. Uh, I'm in the process of diagnosing, diagnosis and staging for cancer. What should I do? Same, same question has been repeated three times. The reason I thought it was important to bring up again, and these questions came up three times in that whole setup, is this message is very clear. If you're in the process of being diagnosed and you have something, go ahead and complete it. Once we know whether you're low risk or high risk, then we talk about the treatment. But the, the process of diagnosing should be completed. We do not delay. We do not wait. It says, oh, well, I'll wait for the COVID to be over. We won't know what you have and would it be too late. So while you're in the process, finish everything. And then you can discuss with your oncologist whether you need the treatment right away or we can prioritize and wait until you're stable or the COVID situation is better controlled. And uh, that's, that's the list of uh, important FAQs that has come through from the American Cancer Society and the cancer.net with ASCO program. Thank you. So these were actually uh, uh, a nice way of you addressing a lot of the questions that have already come up on my screen. And okay. I'm going to take them, you know, one by one. Uh, some of them you've addressed, some of them are still there. Like, um, are all cancer patients supposed to get COVID testing done before their chemotherapy? I think you answered that already. But yes. can you just confirm that, please? Ideally, yes. In the U.S. and in the West, they are getting it done. Okay. Uh, here, we are not doing it routinely. We are doing the screening and looking at the risk assessment, the okay. chart that we created. So if they're low risk, we're not screening them. If they're a little higher okay. risk, we do take. And since antibody uh, testing has been you know, standardized and accepted in the Western countries, it's easy to do it. 15 minutes, you have an answer. Here we're still going with the RT-PCR system. We have to wait a day or two to get the answer. And the process of getting the testing done is still very complicated. It has not been made easy for us. So that's why yeah, we are So here. I think once the antibody tests are available, it may become simpler for the physicians as well as for the patients. Absolutely. Right. There's another question that, is it possible for cancer patients to get chemotherapy done at home? A very, very uh, difficult question to answer. Certain chemotherapies can be done at home, true. And uh, the reason we don't do them at home is, as a physician, I write the prescription for the cancer chemotherapy to be done. I make arrangements for a nurse to go to the home. God forbid there's a complication. We don't have the setup at home to take care of. All right, and there's no nurse technically. Most of these, uh, there are a lot of uh, groups that are saying we are now offering chemotherapy at home. They have ambulance services and nursing services that run it. I don't recommend it at all because I've seen complications with chemotherapy where they have acute bronchospasm. They go into acute respiratory failure and it can happen with any chemo at any time. So you don't have the right. setup at home. So I don't recommend it. Yes, we've switched to a lot of oral chemotherapy. You take that. Uh, we have sub-Q shots. You can do that. Uh, Subcutaneous shots. So those are OK. But intra intravenous infusions, uh, most of the chemos, you know, 5 f continuous infusion, yes, you can go home with a pump. But routinely, no, absolutely not for my 
and right. from most of our colleagues. Uh, there's another question which says, what are some of the common alarms, alarm symptoms that would require someone to seek immediate medical attention? Okay. From because of COVID or because of cancer? No, That's if I, I presume she, uh, this person hasn't clarified, but I presume if you are a known cancer patient, cancer, cancer patient. survivor. So if you're a known cancer patient or cancer survivor, if you're a known cancer patient on active treatment, your immune system is already compromised. If you're a survivor for over three or four months already or six months out, your immune system should be back to normal. The alarms are the same as for the general public. All right. Nowadays, we recommend that you take all your precautions. And if you have symptoms of cough, fever, uh, you know, headaches, unexplained, flu-like symptoms, you're going to contact your doctor your primary care. If you're an oncologist getting chemotherapy, you're going to talk to your oncologist. If you have a pulse oximeter at home and you check your oxygen, if it's below 94%, definitely talk to your doctor. If it's below 90%, there's no question. Run. Get to an emergency room, get to your doctor, get things tested out. We have to think of COVID first, COVID first, COVID first. It's everywhere and it's causing all these symptoms. Once COVID is ruled out, I can look at everything more comfortably. All right. So we cannot miss it. Uh, if you have active COVID infection and you're not very symptomatic, you'll be assessed, you'll be sent home, you get quarantine at home. So the standard guidelines for uh, COVID care is everywhere. It applies to patients with cancer or without cancer. So there are no other alarms that we have to worry about. Now, oncolo oncological emergencies are different depending upon the type of disease they have. So those are different. Right, right. Yeah. Now, you know, getting yourself tested is not the easiest thing to do today. But right. there's a question that said, is it advisable? Since cancer patients are immunocompromised, is it advisable for them to get a test done? And now, uh, it all depends on if the patient is on active treatment or not. Okay. If the patient is disease-free, uh, in remission, being at home with common sense social distancing and no exposure anywhere, then there's no reason to. Okay. If I'm on active chemotherapy and I'm going to the clinic or to the hospital or to certain places more often, when do I get tested? I get tested today, I'm good today, tomorrow. Next week, I'm going to another hospital or another facility for a scan. When do I get tested and how often do I get tested? So there's no clear guideline because the treatment is ongoing and are you going to get tested every time? So again, no. Only if you have the scores, if you go through the assessment score and your risk is high, then you get tested. If you have no symptoms and your risk is low, then you don't get tested. So that's, right, that's right. my answer. So some of the other questions that came in, I think they were answered in the okay. in the Q and A that you did. I think mm -hmm. that was a, a good way to address some of the common concerns and questions that people have. So I think uh, we can conclude today's session, and I'd like to thank you, uh, Dr. Sethi, for addressing such important points related to cancer and COVID nineteen, and for answering no. the many questions. You know, uh, and I think that has reassured people and also cleared a lot of confusion that, that's going on in their heads. Health Travelers okay. Worldwide Services include medical assistance and rescue, medical travel, second opinions, teleconsultations, surgeries abroad, and medical training. I thank them for initiating the knowledge sharing series, and I'm pleased to be a part of it. To get in touch with Dr. Sethi, please contact Health Travelers Worldwide. We also thank Nat Health, Healthcare Federation of India, for lending their support to the program. Please like, share, follow, subscribe to the Health Travelers Worldwide page on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and YouTube for updates and helpful medical information. The knowledge sharing series will be conducted every Saturday at 4 p.m. And I look forward to seeing you with my next guest speaker, the celebrity nutritionist, Ryan Fernando, next Saturday on the 20th of June, 2020. Thank you very much, Dr. Sethi. 
Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Gayatri. And thank, thank you, you all. Uh, health travelers worldwide. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much.